But good evening. Good evening and welcome, especially welcome to all of you who are actually not here for the conference we are running this week, but just for tonight's lecture, which is indeed addressed to you. Um, it's a special pleasure for me to welcome here tonight uh, my colleague and friend, Sharon Glotzer, who is, uh, um, has actually more titles and affiliations I could possibly remember. She is the, I wonder if she remembers them actually some time, but she is, <laughs> she's the John Werner Kahn Distinguished Professor, Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan in Arbor. She's also the Stuart Churchill Collegial Professor, professor of Chemical Engineering, and she has affiliations with the uh, Material Science and Engineering Physics Department, the Applied Physics Department, and macromolecular science and engineering. As you can see, she's an excellent example of uh, the kind of science that we uh, that we embed with, with soft matter, which is sort of spans from uh, engineering to physics uh, to materials uh, uh, to chemistry and, and so on. Sharon is, uh, I would say, one of the world's leading computational scientists, and she has uh, spearheaded the use of uh, computers for the design of assembly of new materials with specific programmed uh, new functions uh, and, uh, uh, and properties. She's a member of the uh, US National Academy of Science, she's a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and you name it. Uh, she is the recipient of uh, numerous international prizes, awards. Most recently, the 2014 uh, medal for the Materials Research Society. And finally, she actually also has uh, distinguished herself for her leadership in uh, condensed matter physics, in physics and engineering in general. Uh, she has been uh, uh, the chair of the Division of Condensed Matter Physics of the American Physical Society. And while being chair of the Division of the Condensed Matter Physics, and this is perhaps more for, more for the physicists than for the general public, but I would like to highlight this, she actually spearheaded the start of a, a new topical group called uh, uh, GSOFT, the Group for Soft Matter Physics. And the physicists, I'm sure, understand there was a bit of a conflict there, but in spite of that, she did a wonderful job at BOT. BOT is chair of, of the condensed matter physics and has new past chair of a group that was never existed before. So this was a very interesting title for her to hold, as a matter of fact. Anyway, if you're not a member of GSoft, by the way, I will really encourage each one of you to join. And uh, with that, I will leave it to Sharon. She is going to tell us about the rise of the colloidal machine. And I said the D is important, or I well, that was wrong. the movie title. All right, and uh, here we go. So, John. Thank you very much. You forgot to say that I was raised as a valley girl and that my birthday falls under the sign of Libra. <laughs> um, so good evening everyone. I am absolutely thrilled to be here um, at this conference and also to be here giving this, um, this lecture this evening. I understand that I'm standing between you and dessert, or me and dessert too, so, um, so, so we'll, get, we'll get right to it. But, but I do want to say that, um, that this, uh, this meeting on active and soft, or I should say smart, is it smart and active matter or active and smart? Whatever. Active matter that's also smart or smart matter that's also active um, represents really a new threshold for a, a new, a new um, frontier for the field of soft matter. It is the, one of the most exciting developments, I think, in science and engineering because it brings together people from uh, physics and chemistry and you know, many engineering disciplines from mathematics and, and applied mathematics, um, everyone all together around a common set of interests and a common set of fundamental principles that we're all trying to understand together to invent an entirely new type of, of material. So my talk tonight is gonna be about colloidal machines, but really it's gonna be about nanotechnology, um, about materials design, about active matter, and um, a little bit about the future. So to start, let's go to the future and then we'll go to the past. So 
Stardate 8390. This is Earth year 2286. There is a probe, a massive probe. This is the probe. And it, every planet it goes by, it completely just destroys the planet. It destroys all of their, their energy systems. It destroys their climate. Any ship it goes past, it completely disables. No one knows what's going on. It's approaching planet Earth. Has anyone seen this movie? Yes. Okay, we've all just dated ourselves. Good. Um, so, meanwhile, the, the, um, the crew of the Starship Enterprise, this would be the first crew of the Starship Enterprise, um, is marooned on the planet Vulcan. I, I forgot what they did. They got in trouble. Something about Spock dying, and I don't know. <laughs> they're all around on the planet Vulcan, and they're supposed to come back to planet Earth, to the Federation, to undergo some kind of trial, something like that, whatever. They are on their way in a stolen, Klingon, cloaked warship, which technically is Romulan technology that the, that the Klingons stole, but I just want to say that because once I said it was Klingon and cloaking technology, and I cannot believe the emails that I received. <laughs> From that. So um, anyway, so they're coming back in this cloak ship, and Spock figures out that this probe is sending out a signal of the sound of the humpback whale. It is looking for a response, and until it gets a response from a humpback whale, which, by the way, in Earth Year 2286 are, are now extinct, it is not going anywhere. So they decide to go back in time to Earth Year 1986 to snatch a couple of humpback whales in order to save the Earth in 2286. And when they get there, they realize that they are facing a materials crisis that can only be solved with computer simulation. So let me go out of this so I can play this. I'm going to go full screen. I'm going to hit play. I might be able to offer something to you. That's too loud? Yeah. I notice you're still working with polymers. Still? What, what else would I be working with? Aye, what else indeed? I'll put it another way. How thick would a piece of your plexiglass need to be at 60 feet by 10 feet to withstand the pressure of 18,000 cubic feet of water? Oh, that's easy. Six inches. We carry stuff that big and stop. I have noticed. Now suppose, just suppose, I were to show you a way to manufacture a wall that would do the same job, but be only one inch thick. Would that be worth something to you, eh? <laughs> it's okay. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. How many have seen that scene? Computer? <laughs> computer? <laughs> Hello, computer. <laughs> Just use the keyboard. Keyboard. How oh, quaint. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. <laughs> okay. So, so why did I make us just watch that? Um, because they basically faced a materials crisis. They had to bring their humpback whales back. They need something that's transparent so they can see the humpback whales and make sure that they're fine. But it has to be strong enough, you know, to bring two of them on a, you know, starship. So. So they had to design this material on the spot. But what is really the vision that we're talking about? The vision is the ability to imagine a material for any specific purpose or function and know exactly how to make it, right? That's the holy grail of material science and engineering and of materials research in general, that you can imagine a possible future where we could say we want a particular material that serves a certain purpose, that serves a certain function, like this transparent aluminum that they needed, and we could just find out what the molecular structure is or how to, how to make it and, and, and make it. Okay, if we could do that, 
that would change everything. It would change everything about the planet and about society because civilizations are defined by the materials that are available to them. And if you go from the, you know, the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age to the Silicon Age, our ability to master available materials and use them in new and novel ways defines the world that, that we live in. So what materials will define our civilization 25 years from now? And that's not so long, because 25 years ago, I was where some of you are now, finishing up graduate school, I think. Yeah. And uh, no, I was like in the middle of grad school, whatever. It's completely plausible that 25 years from now, you will be in this situation. In 50 years, what kind of materials will we have? Will these be just materials that we mine, that we find around us, or they, will they be materials that we design and tailor make like transparent aluminum? And what new physics do we need to make these materials? So we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what kind of physics do we need to imagine making um, a new generation of, of materials on demand. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the use of computer simulation in designing materials. Now, in 1986, of course, this Macintosh Plus is, was able to just rip through and predict transparent aluminum. Um, and since 1986, of course, we all know about Moore's Law, this idea that the number of transistors on a chip doubles uh, every 18 months, and so our, the, the, the computer power basically doubles every, every two years. And, uh, or speed doubles every two years, but we've also been hearing for a really long time about the end of Moore's Law, the end of Moore's Law, that, that feature sizes on chips are, are, are you know, getting down to sub-10 nanometer line widths, and that we have materials problems because you can't get the heat off the chips fast enough, and so there's only, you know, you can only make transistors so small. So how are we going to keep getting faster and faster and more powerful computers? Um, and the answer to that is, is parallelism. And so Moore's, and, 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 and several other things, Moore's law is not really a problem um, because we have new kinds of um, computer chips, um, several new kinds. One of them are graphics processors. You have, they all have them in your computers. They're the things that drive the graphics. And you know every year the graphics on your computers get better and better and better because those chips are getting faster and faster because they're squeezing more and more cores on a single chip. So if you look from 2007, this is the, these are the NVIDIA um, graphics processors. You go from that 2007 to now, the new chips that are just now become available, which have 3,840 cores on a single chip. That's the, the equivalent, the one core is the equivalent of what we used to think of as the CPU. Now we have 3,850 of them, we have a huge amount of memory, over 15 billion transistors on, on a single chip with a sustained performance of over 10 teraflops. That's on a, a chip, a board that's this big and that you could buy for several thousand, like under $10,000. And in a couple years, it'll be caught like the cost of a Tesla, which is like $1,500. Okay, so really fast computation is available today as we go forward, already today, the fastest computers on the planet can run at a sustained um, speed of petaflops, which is 10 to the 15, 1,000 trillion floating point operations per second. Um, and by 2020, we'll be running, the, the expectation is that we'll have codes that can run at a million trillion floating point operations a second. You may have heard of the Exascale Computing Initiative that the White House announced some time ago. This is an, a, a way of getting up to the next scale of big, fast um, machines that eventually one day maybe we'll have on our phones. Um, there's also, as many of you may have heard of, of quantum computing, this is a way of, of, of not just using um, bits that can be zero or one, but using quantum bits that can be combinations, superpositions of zeros and ones, so that you could basically represent much, much more information um, than you could with traditional computing. Neuromorphic computing is another area of development where the idea is to try to um, 
construct computer chips that work the way we think the brain works. The brain has 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion um, synapses. So with this kind of computing power, we're already getting to the level of computing of the human brain. So in terms of being able to get to a future, I don't know if it's 25 years from now, I don't know if it's 100 years from now, but I know that there is a future where we will be computing transparent aluminum and predicting anything else by simply telling a program, which we probably won't have to sit down, we'll just say, if only I had a, a, a material that did this, this, and this, and this, and somebody would answer me and say, okay, you, Amazon will drop it off in a drone outside your house in, in, in three minutes. Okay. Um, and so I think that materials Discovery design by simulation will be will be routine in the future, um, but okay. So, but what do we what do we do with that? So, let's say that we could come up. We we did have the computational power. The computational power means nothing if we don't understand what we're doing. If we don't know what are the fundamental building blocks, what are the interactions and forces between fundamental building blocks? How do they come together to make new materials? We need to have high fidelity, realistic physical models that we can make mathematical models of to solve on the computer. So when we think traditionally of materials, um, many of us will go back to our first chemistry class maybe in high school where we know about the periodic table um, of elements because we think of materials as being made of atoms, which of course they are, but you can also think of, of, of molecules which are made of atoms. Of course, atoms is a convenient packaging of smaller subatomic particles. Right? So the building blocks of atoms need not be the only way we think about building blocks of materials. So this is, a, this is a, an image that I stole from the interwebs, and I couldn't find the attribution. Um, but it shows, this is a, a scale bar from a tenth of a nanometer, otherwise known as an angstrom, up to a millimeter. And down here is an atom, and here's an example of, say, a, a water molecule. And this range in here, that I colored yellow, um, is the range between a nanometer and a little over a thousand nanometers or a couple of microns. This is the scale of nanotechnology. This is the scale on which, for decades now, scientists and engineers have been making new building blocks of matter. Yes, those building blocks are made of atoms at some level, but they're packaging them in ways that now we can think of those as the bricks to make new materials out of. Um, by working at this nanoscale, we have a lot of different um, processes available to us to assemble new kinds of materials with new kinds of properties from these sorts of building blocks. And the kind of building blocks that we're talking about, say carbon nanotubes or buckyballs or quantum dots, um, very, very small um, um, gold, silver, uh, semiconducting uh, nanoparticles made of all sorts of, of materials. These are things that are of the same order of size as proteins and antibodies and, and ribosomes and even viruses and, and, and genes, which, which you know, sequences of, of, of DNA. So in this talk, I said it's the rise of the colloidal machines. When I think about colloidal machines, I'm talking about colloidal particles or nanoparticles um, that are able to organize themselves together into a robot. Not these kinds of robots. This is a Roomba, by the way. How many people know who that is? They get younger every year. Okay. Uh, but this is the kind of robot that I'm talking about. from this face at the end. 
I'm going to use the term liberally and call that a colloidal robot because I'm, going to, I'm, I'm thinking of that as a material that's able to change its shape and morph and exhibit different functions and different properties on, on demand. And if we think about how we're going to make something like that, well, we're certainly not going to make it out of, you know, this isn't just a me like liquid metal. This is something where the constituents of that goo are smart. They're active. They're able to take an energy from their environment and transduce that energy to, to have, say, mechanical motion or you know, actuation and locomotion. Um, so this is a whole different kind of, of material. Here's another example of what I would call an example of a colloidal robot. This is a more recent one. Us? From Things get a little more interesting. The microbots are controlled with this neurotransmitter. I think what I want them to do, they do it. Applications for this tech are limitless. Construction. What used to take teams of people working by hand for months or years can now be accomplished by one person. Okay, so I'm thinking of these particles. So these are microns. I mean, these are big particles that you can hold in your hand. But somehow they're self-organizing into this collective. Um, and, uh, and organizing themselves into different sorts of shapes that presumably would have different, so, different sorts of properties as he's controlling them with his brainwaves. Okay, but aside from that, you can imagine a future where we can scale those microbots down onto the nanometer scale um, so that we can organize them into materials that can change their shape and be responsive like, like those. And I would say, I mean, Looking at the field now, I think that the field of active matter and soft matter is at the very beginning of what will end up to be something like that. Um, so, okay, but we want to we want to then be working in in this range. And why do we want to be work? I mean, we could work in other ranges. This is a special range, in the sense that this is the range where where what we call equilibrium classical thermodynamics holds. It means that we understand and we have expressions for and we have a theoretical framework that can explain how uh, building blocks at this size scale will interact with each other and what kind of, we, we have a way of predicting the kinds of things that they'll form sometimes it's difficult to do it but it's we know how in principle we know the laws by which these particles at this scale will, will interact with one another and to predict their their structures their properties their behavior um, but here's an example. I love this movie. This is from um, Brigitte Nagpal's group at Harvard. Um, the movie I'm going to show you was uh, from a paper they published in Science. And in 2014, this thing I'm going to show you was the runner-up, Science Magazine's runner-up for Discovery of the Year. I can't even remember what the first one was. I mean, runner-up is good. I would take runner-up. Um, OK, so what they're doing here is they're making little robots that are like basically this big and they made a thousand of them so they call them the kilobots and each one of them so you're seeing a thousand of them there and they're all programmed with local rules they're little agents and they have rules about how many neighbors they can have and if they don't have enough neighbors and they do something and and they they don't know what overall shape they're supposed to have but it's pre it's programmed with certain rules and there's like a you know there's a one of them that's special that's sort of dictating what's going on um, but by changing the program that you feed them, where this program has only local rules and they don't know the entire blueprint, these little robots are able to assemble into different shapes depending on the blueprint. So it's the same objects reconfiguring into one shape or another or another or another. And the reason why this was the runner-up of the year, scientific discovery of the year, was because 
even though one could imagine writing algorithms by which little objects would interact with each other and assemble into something, and there have been many simulations along these lines, actually figuring out how to program an actual thing you can hold in your hand and actually achieving that was, um, um, and, and, and getting this, what we call a large-scale autonomous swarm, if you will, although I don't want to, I don't want to bring up thoughts of Michael Crichton's prey, because we're not thinking about that. Um, but if we think about using the Harvard kilobots as a model in our heads to so saying, okay, so they do these with these things that they're, they're you know, little mechanical objects, you can program them. So how would we make the same thing out of colloidal particles, out of nanoparticles? How do we program particles? How do we embed information into particles in order to manipulate their local interactions so that they can respond to different cues and different signals? That's what we need to do to get these kinds, I think, of materials um, like, like, we, like we saw before. And what this really comes down to is understanding and controlling emergence. So I stole this um, definition from Wikipedia, which I don't always recommend, but I liked it. I think it's a good one. In philosophy, systems theory, science, and art, emergence is a process whereby larger entities' patterns and regularities arise through interactions among smaller or simpler entities that themselves do not exhibit such properties. That's the definition of emergence. You cannot look at a single entity, just one of a bunch of things, just look at one of them and predict what the whole group will do. Um, we all have seen emergence before, even if we don't think of it that way. I mean, the stripes um, of, of, of a zebra or the, the fractal nature of different sorts of shells and other objects in nature, um, schools of, of uh, of fish, this is a, a, many of you have probably seen this, let me just run it again. So these are starlings in flight, which we, we see this a lot in Michigan. You look up and it's like crazy what these birds are doing, right? So this is all flocking behavior where these birds are communicating locally with one another, but somehow if you just talk to a single bird, you would never have any idea that the entire collection of birds could undergo, um, could, could exhibit that kind of pattern formation and reconfiguration of the flock. This is an example of a mosh pit, which I should put up here for Itai Cohen. Where's Itai? There he is. You're always sitting in the back. Whatever I, I yeah, okay. Um, so Itai and his colleagues wrote this beautiful paper in PNAS, right? Purell. 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 Sorry. Purell. Um, to, so explaining the collective emergent behavior of groups of individuals in mosh pits. Um, emergence can be seen on many scales. In quantum matter, the idea that electrons can coordinate in such a way that they, um, that they condense basically into a state with no resistance so that current can flow freely for super, and, and have superconductivity is a, a perfect example of an emergent phenomena that just by look, you know, considering a single electron, one would never be able to simply predict that you could have those kinds of, um, that kind of emergent phenomena. And that's given rise to, to all kinds of magnets that we can use now for you know, high-speed trains and for, for MRI scanners. Um, at, you know, for soft matter, at some at larger, say, molecular scales, of course, liquid crystal displays are a great example of emergent phenomena because they're made up of liquid crystals, um, rod-like molecules that can self-organize themselves and by changing their relative orientation to each other can um, change the way that, that, uh, uh, that light interacts and with, with, the, with the substance and change the kinds of patterns that you see and so you're able to control your screens pixel by pixel. In biological matter is probably the, you know, one of the best examples of emergent phenomena. And it really is one of the next frontiers for science and, and, and engineering um, to, to understand and, and in, even in, you know, understanding how the cell works and understanding how the, you know, the many neurons in your brain coordinate themselves to produce consciousness um, is, a, is a great example of emergent um, phenomena. 
But even something as simple as making an ice cube in your freezer from water is an example of emergence because their water molecules are simply reorganizing themselves because the system is cold and by organizing them in a crystal, it's more stable than if it stays as a, as a liquid. That's an example of emergence. Now, it's emergence of a, of a, of a pretty simple structure, um, but those same laws of classical thermodynamics that help us understand why water molecules self-organize and form an ice crystal, those same laws explain why nanoparticles coded, say, with DNA, this is an example from Chad Merkin's group at Northwestern, can self-organize into all sorts of structures that where the nanoparticles are playing the role of an individual atom. So it's making the same structures, but on a much larger scale. Um, this is an example from Chris Murray's group with, um, with rare earth um, nanoplatelets that are coded with different uh, organic molecules on the edges and the surfaces and they self-assemble into different kinds of, of patterns. Understanding that is the, we use the, basically the same physics that we use to understand crystallization of ice. Um, okay, but we want to go more than just, just structure. So if we want to make something like a colloidal robot, then we need materials that sense and respond, meaning there's environmental awareness, we need to somehow achieve movement, a locomotion. Uh, we need to have some level of intelligence or some level of programmability. There needs to be a way of embedding information into the system, into the material, at a number of scales. Um, we need to figure out what's the power source, right? In biology, the power source is, is ATP, right? We use ATP to for our proteins, for anything else to function. It has to convert energy, the body has to convert energy, um, one kind of energy into another kind of energy. So we have to be able to figure out what would be the power source and how do we actuate it? How do we turn that energy, say, into mechanical or another kind of motion? So I think this is an amazing opportunity for the smart matter, active matter community because as I said before, it really takes a village of all of us working together from all sorts of different, yeah, it takes a village, all sorts of different backgrounds to coming together. You know, we need roboticists, we need electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, mathematicians, applied math. We need all of us to come together around such a big, big goal. So some of the key elements of colloidal robotics that are being talked about, maybe they're not being talked about in this context, but they're being talked about in this, in, um, in this conference, are the idea of being modular, right? Like we saw with all of these examples, you have some sort of building block is the right level of thinking about these are the things that are going to self-organize into a larger entity, programmable by, by local rules, by somehow manipulating the shape or interactions of particles, reconfigurable but among multiple states, and compartmentalized. And there's a, there's, there's a lot of talks of this meaning about compartmentalization and, and vesicles of trapping active, active matter. Um, compartmentalization is, of course, critically important in biology because living cells are basically encapsulated within membranes that allows them to, um, to control chemical gradients and contain functional elements that will then transduce um, chemical and physical signals. And this is the way that, that cells will communicate with, with one another. And being able to compartmentalize means that it can undergo chemical reactions here, but, but not over here. Right? It can densify things over here, but not over here. It can get to carry out different sorts of functions at different places in the cell. So compartmentalization of soft matter will be something that's really important. Okay, so what I thought I would do with the remaining time is just to give examples of some very tiny first steps. Um, there's a lot of beautiful examples by many of you in this room that we're hearing about, about this, this week. Um, I'm just going to talk about four of these uh, that we've been working on with, uh, with, with other groups. An example of achieving actuation from, from colloidal particles energy conversion um, uh, with colloids that are comprised of proteins and organic matter, and, and inorganic matter. Um, 
digital colloids and this idea of compartmentalization. So, a first example, and someone should tell me when I should stop talking. <laughs> I have no idea what time it is. What's for dessert? It's not melting or it's not ice cream. No, I don't think it's ice cream. Okay. It's important. Um, for what? Okay. Um, all right. So here's an example from Mike Solomon's group at University of Michigan. Mike makes colloids out of polymer, so little plastic particles. These were made, I think, of PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, um, which is like lucite. And, uh, and he made particles that are basically a micron in, in size. And, uh, and he basically embedded them in a polymer matrix so he could stretch it, stretch the particles, and then release them. So he made all these ellipsoidally shaped particles and then coated one half of the particle, basically this, the, along the long axis, with gold. And the other side was just the, the polymer part, the bare, bare polymer part. Um, when thrown into solution, the gold is attracted to other, to the, the gold faces are attracted to each other. And so he ended up self-assembling these very long fibers. They just spontaneously form in the system. These seem to be very stable. They don't reconfigure into some larger object. They really want to be one dimensional. This is an image through his confocal microscope, and this is a scale bar of, of 20 microns. This just shows the different channels in the, in the microscope, so this is a good image of it. And this is a computer simulation where we made a model of these particles um, and the gold-gold interaction mediated by the, by the solvent where we were able to predict this kind of braided structure. What's, what's, um, what's interesting is with the simulation, something that you, can't, you couldn't really see well under the microscope, is we can actually see how these things are forming. They form in these little bundles of four, and then the bundles of four attach on to make these things. And in principle, they should grow and grow and grow longer, but they don't want to grow any wider. Um, and what's really neat is that his, my student, Ayush Shah, turned off and on um, this AC electric field and when he did that, I'm just going to play it again, the whole fiber actuated, right? It stretched. You elongated the chain by 36% because of the forces that are built up between the, um, between the colloidal particles due to, to, um, to dipole interaction that you're setting up basically between the, um, the two gold sides. Um, and, it, and, and so you can get this, this incredible 36% elongation. So one of the things that we're trying to do now is to aggregate many of these muscles into some long, um, um, you know, compartment. Um, and, and because if you think about muscles, muscles, you know, this is a bundle of muscle fibers. If you pull, if you think about one of the single muscle fibers, they're made of these longer fiber, these other fibers, myofibrils, which are then made up of these individual sarcomeres, we can maybe think of this as the smallest element here. So this isn't really trying to make a muscle, but just trying to think about the simplest colloidal self-assembly that we can get pretty easily in the laboratory. And by we, I mean he. It's easy for me to do it because I don't actually have to make anything. Um, uh, just think about what's the simplest way that you could make an actuating colloidal assembly. Another example um, is uh, Nick Kotoff's group and my group work a lot on um, trying to make interesting assemblies of semiconducting nanoparticles that can be used in a bunch of different um, applications. And one of the applications is in, uh, is in, in solar energy. So one of the things that we were working on was trying to figure out how to self-assemble nanoparticles into objects that could um, take in um, sunlight and convert it to electrons. And so we, um, so they made, so, so Nick's group made these photoenzymatic bionic superparticles, he calls them. Basically, he mixed together cat particles that are just a, a nanometer and a half across with cytochrome C protein, which is a small protein that's basically the size of a cat telluride nanoparticle. It's one of the smaller prote prote um, proteins, and it's, it's um, 
it's important in photosynthesis. And what's really interesting, I won't go into details about this, but, but um, the experts in the audience will, um, will appreciate that these are both have the same charge, and despite them having the same charge in water, they self-assemble into these super particles. These are examples of many of these super particles. They're basically all the same size. This is a 200 nanometer scale bar. They have several hundred of, part of these particles in there. Um, this is a blow up of one of these super particles with several hundred particles in it and proteins in it. And you can see that the proteins and the particles are basically mixed homogeneously within this super particle. This is just a blow up showing the, a, a blow up to show one of the CAD telluride um, DMA coated um, uh, particles. Um, you know, small nanoparticles. And what's interesting is that if you shine light on this, the cytochrome C basically um, controls the, the um, absorption of a photon and causes, with some other stuff involved, um, causes the cat telluride nanoparticles to give up electrons. Okay, so this is an example of something that we would like to think of using as a little energy source. Okay, so making these little nano, these little super particles and embedding them in some kind of a larger material. And so that's something that we're working on with Mike Solomon and, and with, with some others. Um, this is an example of work from um, the NYU group. I think some of the NYU group are here. Somebody, somebody's here. There you are. Um, this is work uh, that where um, they came up with these colloidal particles that Dave Pine calls them Pac-Man particles. I don't think they look anything like Pac-Man, but whatever. Um, these are particles, like micron-sized plastic particles that have a dimple. And the dimple um, basically can attach via what we call depletion interactions to a smaller particle of similar radius. Not identical radius, but very, very close uh, radius. So those two particles can come together. They made these things, so you could see here's one of these dimpled Pac-Man particles, and a little particle, when it comes close enough, gets trapped in here, and once it's trapped, it's basically there forever. But it's not a, a typical kind of bond, it's what we call a, a, de a depletion interaction, which is something that's very common in, in, in biological systems, um, which is basically an entropic force, which we won't talk so much about, but What's important about it is that the, this entropic interaction has the big dimpled particles sticking on this little particle strongly enough that they don't want to come apart, but not so strongly that it can't rotate freely all around. So this is one of the earliest examples, I think, of, of a mechanically reconfigurable colloidal object, little micron-sized object. Okay, so then they showed that they could make this at different, you know, they could put you know, two lobes on here, they could put three lobes on here, depending on the various sizes, they could, they could build these things up. And so why do we care about that? Because we were thinking about how can we embed information at the colloidal scale? Like, what if we wanted in this new kind of, you know, wet material, this new kind of material, to be able to disperse things that, that could carry out logical operations without having to be made of silicon. Okay, so many people work with DNA to do that because with the four base pairs of DNA, you can do all sorts of computation. Um, but we were thinking, how can we do this with nanoparticles or colloidal particles? Um, and so one of the ways to think about it is, you know, if we could embed information here and we could switch the, inform we could switch the configuration, basically we want to identify information with the configurations of the of the particles. So their particles are basically like, okay, if you have, if the big particles are big enough, everything's locked in place. But if you imagine somehow you could de-swell them or just swell the middle particles, some, some way to unlock them, then they could be free to move around and then maybe you could lock them back again. So you can think of these as colloidal Rubik's cubes, if you will. Okay, the key thing is if that if you could make every one of these particles <coughs> distinguishable from one another, say a different color, which is not easy to do, but let's say you could do that, then every pattern, every configuration of colors would encode information. 
And so, for example, if you have uh, you know, four particles, you basically have a tetrahedral orientation. There are only two possible different states of four particles together, and I'll, sh I'll show that better in a, in a second. Um, but the number of storable states, the number of bits that you can encode in these mechanical colloids increases very rapidly as you add more and more particles to this little colloidal cluster. So, for example, here's a what we call the simplest colloidal bit. This is an n equals 4 colloidal particle cluster where there are four of these around a central particle. And on the left is the team at NYU is basically using optical tweezers to grab a hold of these micron-sized particles because we didn't want to wait a year for them to, to get this to just spontaneously work. So we said, can you just push them? So they use optical tweezers to trap them and basically build it up. OK, now they've got this little tetramer with four particles around. So that one didn't work, so they pulled in another one. OK, wait, no, that's three. They still got to get that guy on there. Mm -hmm. Come on. Go. Oh. OK, so there it is. So now they have four particles attached to a central particle. And in, in the next movie, now they're just watching this thing. And they're watching it undergo like a reconfiguration. So the movie on the left shows you basically what's happening over here. That this is a configuration. It's, it's, there's a red one, a blue one, a yellow one in the back, and a green one here. Okay. If you look at this, these images here, this one on the right where you have green, blue, yellow, red, is an enantiomer of that. These are, these are, um, one is, th these are, this is a chiral cluster. So you can't map the colors of one onto the colors of another. So these are two distinct states. You can think of this as a zero and a one. So if you could write a zero that somehow unlock the cluster and have it, and then re, you know, read it, lock it again into you know, a zero or one, whatever you need, then you could imagine building up information. Okay, so, so far, this is really as far as it's gotten, um, because one of the challenges, of course, is to actually have distinguishable particles, how to read write. This is a you know this is not a, maybe a practical approach at all, but at least it's a way of thinking about how to embed information at the nanoscale in ways that are that are new and can be used in places where you wouldn't want to use silicon. Um, okay, and as, as a last example, I'll talk a little bit about hierarchical compartmentalization. So we talked about wanting to compartmentalize things like, like biology does. So this is an example of an active matter system. Um, it just looks like you have yellow particles and blue particles, and somehow they don't like each other, and so they're space separating. And those of us who study this kind of phenomena say, well, that looks like spinel decomposition of a binary mixture where yellow and blue don't like each other, and somehow when you get in the very center here, they're, they're so dense that they just go ahead and, and crystallize. And that is basically what's going on. Um, but what's interesting is that these are actually particles that are absolutely hard particles. There's no interaction energy between them, but they, but they rotate. So they're, they're, they're made like these little gears, and they spin in opposite directions. Um, and, uh, and, and it turns out that, if they're, that when you have particles that spin in opposite directions, like this, they basically just spin past each other. When they spin in similar directions, and they have these little knobs for gears, they can get stuck temporarily. And that temporary stuckness is like a bond, like a chemical bond, not a chemical bond, like a chemical bond. Um, that gives you basically an effect of attraction between like rotating ones and a repulsion between unlike rotating ones. And that simply steric interaction in this actively driven system where they're driven to rotate um, in opposite directions is enough to to cause this emergence of this, of this compartmentalization, this pattern formation. And at this meeting, there's many examples, there's many folks in the audience who ha have done beautiful work, including Christina and, 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 and others, on self-propelled colloids and showing how if you simply take hard particles or even hard sticky particles, but you, you cause them to, to, to have a, a driving force, like a little jet pack on their back, and they self-propel, they can, um, they can form all kinds of interesting um, patterns like the one that I showed you. What's different here is that these are rotating instead of being self-propelled. So it's just different degrees of freedom that we're tapping into. 
What I think is cool about the rotating ones is that we can actually then use this compartmentalization um, for, for transport. Um, we're trying to see, okay, so what can we do with that? What if we could compartmentalize them further and put them inside of a membrane where we also are driving, say, the rotation of the particles that are making up the membrane and using that, we can actually, these boundaries can influence what's going on um, on the inside. What's really interesting is now you see that even though yellow likes yellow and blue likes blue, the yellow wants to be near the blue boundary and the blue wants to be near the yellow boundary. Matthew Spellings is here. Raise your hand. He did this. He can tell you why that is. Um, one of the things we're looking at is by if we could somehow activate the spinners on the outer membrane and change the pattern on the outside, then even with inert particles on the inside, we could start to change the shape of this. So trying to think about how to do this on some colloidal scale, something that was achieved with these, heart, these kilobots by the, on a much larger scale um, by, this, by this Harvard group. Okay, but these are all computer simulations. It's possible to actually make these um, like you know, print little particles like this and put them on an air hockey table. We've done that, others have done that. Um, but of course, this is a long way from um, actually being achieved. Um, we're working with uh, George Whitesides and Paul Chicken and Sam Stoop and others um, as part of an Energy Frontier Research Center to actually realize some type of um, driven active matter system that's encapsulated in some sort of a of a membrane. Um, Sam Stoops group makes these interesting polymerosome sacs that we think we might be able to use that by triggering what's going on in the inside, we could cause this whole thing to start locomoting, crawling. Okay, so that's some of where, where we're going with this. Um, this is just an interesting image of what happens when you put many of these um, little colloidal cells or whatever together um, and you get this interesting kind of, of sub super diffusive dynamics. Um, which is which is sort of interesting. Okay, I just want to throw that in there. I think it's a good time to end. So take homes. Next generation matter will be functional and information rich. I think this idea of colloidal robotics, although we're really a long way from that, but you could sort of see where a lot of the work that many of you are doing could fit into that kind of a an, um, application. Um, that's just one example. I think active matter has a critical role to play, and from where I look, active matter today is like the Wild West. There's so much that we don't know in active matter um, that there's just a ton of stuff to do. Um, and simulation will, of course, be a key driver for discovering science. So I'll leave that up here, maybe take a couple questions, and then we can have dessert. Use your outdoor voice. How's that? Is this, is this better? Yeah. <laughs> there, Christina has a microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, very interesting, wonderful work. Um, but um, so I was telling my wife today um, about how I was going to sh see Sharon Blosser talk about how we can get the microbots from Big Hero <laughs> Six to be a reality, and my wife, who is not a scientist like me, uh, said that sounds very cool, but didn't the creation of those microbots cause evil people to kill a lot of people and steal a lot of things? Oh my God, it's such a detail. <laughs> and so, and, um, so but, and I mean, all joking aside, I mean, I think uh, as scientists, we do tend to get caught up in the passion and the joy and the curiosity uh, that comes into being able to do these things. But I think we can all agree that the ability to at will, make a material do whatever you want, and just have that kind of power, if unregulated in the wrong hands, I think it's, it's very dangerous. And I really, uh, I'm, so again, I'm not saying that we should stop look, uh, researching in active matter and soft matter and these things, but what I'm saying is I feel like as scientists, we do have responsibility when our research is potentially this risky to not ignore the potential human ramifications, and I really was wondering what your perspective on that would be. 
Yeah, thanks very much for that for that comment and question. I, it's an excellent point. So I have I would say a few things about that. First, I don't know of any technology that's ever been invented that cannot have uses in a good way and also nefarious potential uses. This is true of, of all science and engineering and, and technology. This is this is true of any kind of medical breakthroughs. We think of medical breakthroughs as being to make us healthy, but of course. Anything we do can, can be used in other ways. So I absolutely agree with you that one has to think about these things. And, and I mean, that's, a, that's you know, the philosophers have saying that, say that about technology um, all the time. I think that this exact question is hitting us right on the head right now with CRISPR and this a whole idea of gene editing. I know, do you know what I'm talking about? So this, this ability, all of a sudden, to very quickly, very cheaply, anyone on the planet can get one of these things and just start editing genes and making up whatever sort of, you know, making new genomes, making new, new types of things. And that's exciting, but this is also causing a lot of people to start asking questions about, so how do, you know, do we regulate this? How do we regulate this? I, th I think this is true of any sort of a, any sort of, big technological advance. I think, I think it's important, I think it's something we, we don't teach, we don't talk about in classes, right? We don't really talk about in research groups, we just say, oh, let's make cool stuff. Um, and I think there's definitely a role for that. Any other questions? Yes. Can we start the line? Do you want to make more passwords? Okay, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, so going back to Terminator, um, so, you know, I was thinking about, about that, and I was wondering if that's really feasible, right? Um, and I guess in the sense of um, having some, some one sort of material do have that many sorts of uses, uh -huh. and I guess what I'm thinking is, sort of humans are the ultimate, uh, you know, smart material, and we can build many sorts of things, but in order to build any thing that's relatively complicated, you have to have this huge infrastructure, uh -huh. right? So, you know, I, I, I guess I would think that instead of that Terminator robot, you would have nanobots that use the environment and uh -huh. shape things out of it. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, what do you think are the sort of the limitations of... So I completely agree with you that one should absolutely question the use of the Terminator as an example. <laughs> I use it not to be a literal example that says, I really, really want to make that silver goo that turns into whatever that guy name who's now on Scorpion and not on... No? Nobody watches Scorpion? Okay, whatever. It's a show. Really? Nobody? Okay. Anyway, so, so yeah. So, I mean, there's so many questions of, about how do, you, how do you interact with the environment? How do you take energy from the environment and, and change it? How, to, you know, how does this material renew itself? Can it even work without understanding how to achieve self-replication, self-repair of the material? There's just so, there's so many hurdles to, to overcome. So, I agree with you that... I like Big Hero 6's example better because you could start to imagine individual micro-mechanical building blocks that get smaller and smaller and become nano-mechanical building blocks. Of course, there's all these other issues that, that come to play when you talk, start talking about nano-machines. So I use these examples not so much to be literal, let's go make those, but just to try to be provocative and push this idea of how do we think about smart materials and how do we think about materials that we see in science fiction, the, the kinds we see in science fiction that we don't have available to us today? What would it mean for our field? What kinds of questions would we have to ask? Okay, thank you. Any other question? If not, we can actually ask more question, Sharon. We do actually, I believe, have some results up there. So we can all go there and that's Great. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.